So we have the next speaker, uh, Nisa Vikramasika from uh, University of Cambridge. So his lecture will be variational theory of minimal hypersurfaces in the many manifolds. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very pleased and honored to be, to be here. Um, so I am, um, uh, between these two lectures, sort of what I want to mainly focus on, on, on the regularity side of uh, the, this uh, theory of minimal surfaces, minimal hypersurfaces. But I thought I'll start with um, a bit of a sort of a, you know, sampling of, of, of various results throughout the history. This subject has a long history. And uh, just to sort of give you a perspective of where the, the most recent developments sort of fit in somehow. So in this first lecture, um, I can find the clicker, yep. We will uh, survey some old results. Um, and then, uh, and obviously, as I said, the literature is very vast. So I'll, I'll choose the, the results that are most sort of directly relevant to, to the recent, recent progress um, that I want to talk about. So, so, the, so the plan here is to. Um, introduce minimal submanifolds and show you how you can characterize them as a variational problem. And then I'll discuss a weak formulation of, of the minimal submanifold problem. So then in that, in the language of, of, of geometric measure theory, these weak minimal surfaces we call stationary integral variables. I'll tell, them, I'll tell you what they are. And then, uh, then we will, after that we will, so here we will be in arbitrary co-dimension in first two um, parts, and then we will get to co-dimension one theory and discuss um, regularity first, and then I'll show you how all that can fit into the question of finding a, a classical minimal hypersurface in, in a compact Riemannian manifold. That's it. It's a well-known theorem. It's one of the landmark theorems of the subject. But recently, there, there is, has been a new, new proof, the different set of ideas. Uh, and then in the second talk, I will actually focus on an extension of this regularity theory to a bit more general setting. Okay? And then we'll discuss some of the ideas of the proofs. That's sort of the plan. So we're going to consider a uh, Riemannian manifold N, and then a submanifold of some dimension K. I'm going to use N plus 1. Sorry, I, uh, I should have said N plus 1. I'm going to use N plus 1 for the ambient dimension, because I want to focus on the hypersurface case later on, and then I'll use, the, use N for the dimension of the, of the submanifold. So then, of, then we have the, the second fundamental form of such a submanifold, which is given by this, this formula given to any local vector fields, V1 and V2 on, on M. You just, um, this, this here is the Riemannian connection. And then you take this quantity and then project it to the normal direction. So this perp means the normal part to the submanifold. And so this defines a uh, symmetric bilinear map. And so that this is, so therefore, it only depends on, so the value at a point depends only on the, on the vectors at that point. And then, so the trace of this is an important quantity. This is called the mean curvature, which you can compute by taking any orthonormal basis and then using this formula. And then the, by definition, a submanifold is minimal if, if it's this mean curvature vector. So this is now a vector pointing in the normal direction at every point on M. Um, it is minimal if this is 0 everywhere. 
Now, the, this is, if you apply all of this to one dimension, what you get is the geodesic equation. So these are geodesic, the minimal submanifolds are higher dimensional generalizations of, uh, of, of the notion of geodesic. And one very nice thing about this condition of minimality, mean curvature being zero, is that you can characterize it as a variational property. It is, um, submanifold is minimal um, if and only if it is a stationary or critical. I'll use, I'll use these both words to mean the same thing, stationary or critical, for the uh, k-dimensional area function. Now, for the moment, we'll just assume that that functional means just the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure. We will soon change that. Somewhat, but it is some. Uh, for, for now, it's k dimensional measure, household measure. And so, that because of this fact, um, uh, you can, you know, then you can take this and, and develop a theory. And then, this is in fact a theory that has a very long history and some of the beautiful theorems. And surprising theorems have come out of it. And also, perhaps more importantly, a number of techniques that were initially developed in, in studying this have had applications in, in many, many areas, in geometry, PD, and calculus of variations. Um, um, right, so, but this is, if you think about this, is sort of very simple geometric setting. Right? The area function is perhaps the simplest geometric function you can think of. And already the theory is extremely rich there. So we're going to survey some initial initial part of the first part of this lecture, first lecture, uh, survey a bit of the history. But I'll start sort of around 1960 and then go up to the present. And why why 1960? Well, I had to start somewhere. I couldn't go to minus infinity. Um, and because before that, roughly speaking, the people studied this this question minimal surfaces as a as a mapping problem, more or less, you know, sort of so-called plateau problem, if you, for the experts. Um, in 1960s, so then people realized that these, these techniques of studying these things as mappings is only very two-dimensional, so it would not generalize to high dimensions. So you had to come up with new ideas to do this in high dimensions, and that all began in the 1960s. Now, um, so let's just try to, in, on this slide, uh, understand a little bit closely, a little bit better, what this uh, variational uh, property really means. So what does a critical point of stationarity for area mean? Well, you just take an ambient vector field X with compact support, and then you deform. So given any submanifold, you deform this by this vector field in this way. Take one parameter family of diffeomorphisms. morphisms. Um, generated by x, so the initial velocity is x. You're not changing anything outside the support of x. You keep everything fixed. You, you deform the thing submanifold inside the support of the vector field. And of course, there are many such families you can choose, but just pick one. And then um, you differentiate this map, the t, that takes t to the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure of the deformed submanifold. That is a differentiable uh, function, um, and you differentiate at t equals 0. You, so you get this quantity. This is, by definition, that f first derivative at t equals 0 is called the first variation of m uh, with respect to the area function. And it's a calculation that you can do easily, and, and, and you end up getting this formula. So that tells you that, in particular, that this first variation only depends on x, doesn't depend on the family phi t you chose, it's only in the initial velocity. That's what that matters. Um, so this, this quantity, this divergence, is on m. It's by projecting onto m. So this is given by this formula here for um, can compute by choosing an orthonormal basis for the tangent space. Okay, so then I'm going to make a definition here now. Uh, so we could say m is stationary or critical. 
with respect to the k-dimensional area if this first variation is zero for every such vector field. Okay. So these are directional derivatives, if you like. Now, we are going to connect this to the mean curvature, as I as promised. It's fairly easy. You just take uh, the vector field x, and you can write it as the tangential part and the normal part, and then compute the divergence of the normal part. It's an easy calculation based on the fact that these tangent vectors are well, normal to x perp. You end up getting this, this formula, which that tells you that when you go back to the formula, this formula here, and plug in um, for the divergence, the tangential divergence bit gives you a boundary term by the divergence theorem, and the normal bit gives you this mean curvature. Okay, so then, so this says that minimality of M, together with the fact that boundary being empty, that is equivalent to saying that M is stationary in N for any, for deformations by compactly supported vector fields. Now, a very crucial thing here to observe is, is this, what's written here, namely that so let's, so here in this formula, if you look at this term, you, this is classical, if you want to understand mean curvature, it's, you need at least C2 regularity for, for the um, submanifold. But if you look at the other condition, let's just assume it's sort of a boundaryless situation. So these are, you have this formula here. On the other side, you have this, which only requires first derivatives, C1, even less. You can make sense of this condition for a very large class of very singular um, varieties, or whatever you want to call them, submanifolds, namely these k-rectifiable sets. And that k-rectifiable means that it has locally finite measure, k-dimensional Hausdorff measure, together with the fact that there is a notion of a k-dimensional tangent uh, plane, tangent space, at uh, almost every point with respect to the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure. See, that's all you need. If you look at the expression for this divergence, and remember, it, it, as soon as you have some notion of tangent space, you can compute that. We can also, x, x is a smooth vector field here. M is, the, M is the one we are relaxing the regularity assumptions on. And it, it, it is a, it's a theorem, in fact, in this, about rectifiable sets, that this definition that having a tangent plane at almost every point, once you have finite measure, is equivalent to saying that your set is covered by a countable union of C1 submanifolds up to a set of measures zero. If you throw away a set of k-dimensional measures zero, and the rest is contained in a countable union of C1 submanifolds. That is equivalent. So now you can imagine how bad these sets can be. Anything you can pretty much think of is a, is a rectifiable set. So you can have pretty, really bad singular behavior. But still, this would make sense. So then this gives you an idea about how you might prove an existence of a minimal submanifold in a Riemannian manifold. You, you first find a rectifiable set which satisfies this. And then um, we try to prove regularity that, in fact, the fact that it satisfies this condition must mean more. Right? Try to somehow exploit this, this, this freedom of the vector fields you can plug in, in here to try to prove actually what you found must be regular. So in principle, this is a good strategy, but obviously easier said than done. But, you know, but generally speaking, this is kind of the philosophy of, of proving the classical existence of classical minimal submanifolds in, in Riemannian manifolds. This is, this is sort of the strategy always. Um, let's see. So, um, so ju just to say that what has been achieved uh, by following this strategy, more or less, you could try to minimize in, in 
some class, some homology class um, or fixed boundary some, under some constraint like that, that will produce a critical point. Um, but then this fails when there's no homology. If the homology is trivial, then you, you have to use other methods like min max constructions to, to look, which are designed to, to capture unstable critical points. So I'll get to some details of, of this in, in a minute. And to give an example, if, if, if n has a positive Ricci curvature, then there are no compact smooth minimal hypersurfaces on, on, on m. So in that situation, you, you have to resort to finding a, a method that gives you some kind of unstable critical point, like, like uh, some sort of mountain pass lemma, min max procedure. But we'll get to some details of that in a second. But let me make a little digression here. Um, sort of discuss a little bit about the PDE analog of this. At the same time, I can, I can actually then um, point out what mean max constructions, how, how they go um, usually. Um, so, so if you want to solve, a find a harmonic function, let's say, on a bounded domain, and this is a familiar situation, I hope, to many people, you just re recognize this, that harmonic means critical point for this um, Dirichlet energy. So in the fixed boundary case, you can minimize this Dirichlet energy in, in, the, in the Sobolev space. Okay. So the Dirichlet energy plays the role of the uh, area functional in the geometric setting. And Sobolev space is your set, space of rectifiable sets. We will change that in a minute. It's not a good space, but roughly that's the idea. Um, so then use compactness theorems, the, 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 this completeness and compactness properties of these Sobolev spaces to, to find a minimizer for this, under this constraint. And then you notice, okay, so you have a minimizer, then, then you say, okay, if so the minimizer is a critical point, so you get some weak equation. So this is like the, the, the stationarity condition that I wrote down in the previous slide. You have this weak formulation of what it means to say it's a solution and use that itself to improve regularity. This is, this is all extremely easy to do, but the philosophy now remains, carries over to the geometric setting. So that's just the constraint, under the constraint of a fixed boundary. But then, of course, you can think about, what about the unconstrained problem? If you have a harmonic function of compact manifold, well, these are trivial, right? They're, by the maximum principle, they're constant. So this particular function is not so interesting for that, but you can change that in, in, in very quickly to something uh, more interesting, um, namely the Allen Kahn equation. Now, I chose this example because it's going to play a, a very crucial role towards the end of this lecture right, in, the, in the exact sort of minimal surface setting. So, but still, we are working on the PD setting now. We're trying to find a solution to this equation now, um, which is the Allen, elliptic Allen Kahn equation. Um, and it is, then you, again, you, you um, interpret them. They are, actually, they are critical points of this, uh, this uh, Allen Kahn functional, easy to check, yeah? Where W, this W is a, it's a function that looks like that. It's a so-called double well potential function. Non-negative function has precisely two minima at minus one and one. And then, so of course, it's easy to see that the, the, if you look at global minimization, unconstrained minimization, it will only give you minus one and one. So uninteresting, these two constants. These are the only ones that make this functional zero. And zero is obviously the minimum, it's an unnegative function. So, so that's, not, that's not very interesting. But you can actually, unlike for the harmonic uh, function case, produce min max critical points, interesting non constant min max critical points. And the way it goes is, it, it, this, in this setting of Allen Kahn equation, that is based on the fact that there is a fixed constant such that the functional is bounded, fixed positive constant such that the function is bounded below by that constant if you are under this constraint of zero average. That's easy to see, so it's a consequence of essentially the Poincaré inequality. 
the, this infimum in this, in this sub subspace is, is attained. That's what you have to show. And once it's attained, you know that it has to be uh, non-constant because it can't be uh, minus 1 or 1, right? Because you have, we have this constraint. And that, then you notice that if you take a, so you, you have these two minimizers, u1 and u2, which are minus, identically minus 1 and identically plus 1 functions. You can consider paths in the Sobolev space W12 that connects them, and uh, so call them gamma t. Going, so gamma 0 is minus 1, and gamma 1 is 1 as functions. Um, and any such path would pass through a uh, zero average function. And therefore, you have a lower bound, same lower bound for, for, this, for the energy along any such path. Right? And then you invoke a standard you know, mountain pass lemma, which says that for good functional satisfying appropriate conditions, and the keyword here is the palace mail, I, I won't get into any details of that. But, but we are, the important thing is we work in a Hilbert space and we have very standard te techniques um, which allows you to conclude that in this situation, once you have this property that every path goes through a high energy point and you connect the two global minima, then you, minimize the, you can minimize that maximum energy along path and that will be attained by fun some function and that it will be a critical point. Of, of most index at most one. Now you have to allow it to be unstable. Okay. So this is nice. So this is this is we will we will use this actually later on. Okay. So now back to the minimal surface problem. Um, now, so if you look at the an analogy here, so you, you you need you need to have the right space to work in. Right. Rectifiable sets uh, is not the right space because it lacks appropriate sort of comp compactness properties. And also, if you follow min-max procedures, it's important that the functional is continuous on, the, on your space. So if our functional is the area functional, and it's not continuous unless you allow, when, when, when two sheets sort of come together, you, unless you allow yourself to count them as two rather than one. So the, the, the measure has to be continuous. So that, that means that you need to introduce a, a multiplicity function on the rectifiable set. And this complicates things dramatically on the regularity side, but it allows you to prove existence theorems. So the space now we have changed somewhat, we have enlarged it by allowing a, um, a multiplicity uh, a function, and then say we, we can take some appropriate weak topology on the space, like say measure theoretic convergence, for instance, would, is uh, what we, the natural thing to do. And, and, and then there are powerful compactness theorems in geometric measure theory that tells you that it's enough to consider integer multiplicity, positive integer multiplicity. And so such, these objects are called integral powerful. So it's integral powerful is, is just a, a rectifiable set. So it has a tangent plane at almost every point. And then it has a locally integrable integer valued function defined on it. That is the, that is the multiplicity function. Okay. Still very, sort of very, very extremely large space, very singular space. Um, but, but the remarkable thing is that Armgren 1960s so this is my first result I want to mention, uh, proved that, in fact, in this space, roughly speaking, um, that you can actually find a weak minimal, um, boundaryless minimal submanifold working in this space. Um, so. So we have a stationary integral k variable for every integer k between one and, the, and n. n plus one is our dimension of the, of, the, of the ambient space. And so what does that mean precisely? Now, I, 
I said that for rectifiable sets, this condition makes sense. So if you have multiplicity, all that means is that only the only difference as far as the weak equation is concerned is, is that you have this multiplicity function in front of the measure. So you think of this as your measure. So you, you, you've changed your space as well as the area functional to count now multiplicity, area with multiplicity. So I'll denote this by this measure. This norm V means the k-dimensional house uh, of measure um, restricted to theta. Once you extend theta to be the whole, in the whole space by defining it to be zero outside, outside the set that you started with. Okay? And that's called the weight measure associated to, to the varifold. So in fact, the, the same calculation that you would do to get the first variation formula will tell you, in fact, that that condition that's being zero for every vector field would actually, it, it does mean this here. You are, it is the first derivative for the weight measure. The deformed variable is, is, is the, you deform it the natural way, you, you map it. You have the set and the function, and this, this defines the new variable after deform it. Then you can take the weight measure, and then, you know, that's the function t differentiable and then compute the derivative you get exact calculation same thing gives you that fact okay so Armgren's theorem tells you that there, there are stationary points for that functional and once you know stationarity you want to understand regularity once you know that you, you these things exist and the first thing to observe is that you can immediately actually discard the original set M, rectifiable set, and, and just work with the support of the measure. It is better because it's a closed set and it agrees with the original one, except for a set of measure zero. So you're in the same class. See, see the variables really is an equivalence class. If you have two rectifiable sets that are agreeing, except for a set of measure zero, you should, it makes no difference in any of the formulas to plug in one or the other. And similarly, the multiplicity function as long as it, it is the same on the intersection of the two sets, right? Um, that's what that matters. So that, that is, therefore defines an equivalence relation, and that's what we're talking about here, here is actually the equivalence classes. And this, once you have stationarity or some control of the mean curvature, I haven't defined what mean, mean, mean curvature means in this setting, but I'll come to that actually next lecture, in fact. It's possible to define weak mean curvature. Once you have some control of the mean curve, weak mean curvature, not necessarily zero, this, this support of the measure is, 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 a, is a good representative always for the, for the class. And the advantage is that that support is a closed set. It's a closed rectifiable set now. The original set might have had very sort of low dimensional pieces coming out of that, right? You're, you're ignoring a set of measure zero by definition. So you can have really bad behavior, almost like you can have a very nice set of plane and then like a dense set of, sort of lines, you know, nearly filling, trying to fill up the whole space. As far as measure is concerned, these tentacles contribute nothing, but the geometric object is very complicated. So you don't want that. You don't cut that out. So we take the, the support of the measure, it, dis, it disregards all of that. Okay? So that's a nice sort of a first step towards getting something nicer. So now the question of regularity. That is the big question. Still today is the big question, really. In this generality, if you only have stationarity, this is an open question. Except that we know, since 1972, this landmark paper of Allard, which proved many things, and, and one of the corollaries, this is his theory, is that the stationary variables have a dense set of regular points. So here the definition is the, is the, the standard one. A regular means it's embedded smoothly embedded near that point, and singular means it's the complement in, of the regular part in, in the support. So what Allard showed is that the regular set is there, somewhere there. It's, a, it's, a, it's open by definition, obviously, but it's a dense set in the support. But it can be very small in measure for all we know. This is important to keep in mind that something like a fat canter set, whether that can happen as a singular set, is actually an open question. 
Now, the, the, what is the enemy? How, why is it? So, so the picture to keep in mind of this, the, the worst kind of singularities is sort of having two sheets like this. So if, this is a, if these are minimal, then the PD maximum principle tells you this can't happen, you can't have them touching. But what you can imagine is that there's a sequence of necks converging to that point. Making this a singular point, it's a non-embedded point. Away from that, even this very simple question, two-dimensional in R3, it's smooth except at one point. Can this be removed? Is that a, is that such a, can such a thing exist as a minimal surface? It's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental open question about stationary variables. It, it is known that, that it has to have locally infinite genus if such a thing exists here. And, and so this is the thing to keep in mind. So I, of course in this picture there's only one singularity, but you can imagine that if such a thing can happen, then this probably, ha you know, whether that picture can happen on a very big set of positive measure. This is what's not been ruled out. Um, so by, by a recent result of uh, Ulrich Manner, we, we also know that V has a C2 rectifiable structure. Remember rectifiable by definition means C1 structure underlying, right? It's containing a C1. Uh, countable unit of C1 submanifolds, but Ulrich's, this is quite remarkable. This proves that if you have even less than stationary is enough. Some weak me, me, mean coverage in L1 would be enough. Um, that, in fact, it has a C2 rectifiable structure. But it doesn't give you information about how big the regular, or how small the singular set has to be. Okay. Now, as I said, the multiplicity is the enemy here, right? This is, so here at that point, you have a multiplicity two tangent plane. If you take, rescale the thing, you get uh, things coming, you know, two, two bits coming together and forming a multiplicity two tangent plane. So if you, if you have multiplicity one, so from now on, I'm gonna focus on the co-dimension one theory where much is somewhat sort of surprisingly in the end, actually. I, uh, you'll see in a minute why. Under extremely weak sort of hypothesis, weak looking hypothesis, you can get the best results, sharpest results in code dimension one. For, not for stationary ones, you need, a, you need, you need sort of stability, but in a kind of a very weak form of stability. That's all. This is where I'm heading to, towards. Um, um, so, so what is stability? Well, stable means second variation non-negative. So take the same function, same class of deformations. You ask that the second, first derivative would be zero and the second derivative non-negative, right? So it's a, it's a condition that sits between stationarity and absolute area minimizing. Okay. So this class contains the minimizers, for instance. Now, if you're in co-dimension one, the, the stability gives you a good control of the extrinsic curvature, the second fundamental form, full norm of the second fundamental form. This is, the, this is called the stability inequality. You derive it by plugging into this deformation, this, this, this requirement, second derivative non-negative, by, by plugging in a normal vector field. So every, in co-dimension one, you can write a, a, so a vector field that's normal on the, on the surface as a function times the normal vector data is a function, and you plug into this requirement and you, you end up getting this formula. Where this means the Ricci curvature in that the normal direction, and A is the second fundamental form. And this, this expresses the fact that, that uh, this, this um, Jacobi operator, this elliptic operator, which is written here, is non-negative. It has directly non-negative eigenvalues. Now, in higher co-dimension, of, of course, stability makes sense, but then it doesn't give you as good control. And in fact, um, um, it, it is, it's, the situation is extremely complicated, even for area minimizers. Um, so then, um, the, the sort of the starting point, a breakthrough uh, result 
for stable, and once you have stable hypersurfaces, these compactness theorems that were proved first by Shane Simon Yao for dimensions up to five, and then extended to all dimensions by Shane Simon. You are in a classical setting, more, or almost sort of more or less classical. In other words, you assume your singular set is a priori small. So in, if you're in low dimensions, that means you're completely smooth here. And then such a class is compact once you have a uniform mass bound. So this is, this is, this, this is the one, th th this theory, this compactness theorem is the one that led to much better understanding of an existence in co dimension one. Among other things, it's been applied in many different ways in other problems too. Um, so here, let me just remind you again, singular, as I define, you can think of the singular set as a, as a singular set of the waterfold corresponding to M taken with multiplicity one. But that, that's really the same thing as saying that it's just the topological boundary of M, provided you don't do silly things like removing points from nicely smooth guys and calling them singular. So if there are no uh, removable singularities, then, then under that assumption, it's just a, uh, the topological boundary. So you can have, so M, M denotes a smooth part and then you, you come together singular point. Okay. Um, there is also a regularity component to Schoen Simon theory. They didn't have to assume singular set is n minus seven dimensional. It would have been enough, and the paper shows that, that it is enough to assume the Hausdorff measure, n minus two measure, is finite. So once you know that, you can reduce it to um, n minus seven and then prove compactness. But still, nevertheless, you have to assume a priori that the singular set is small, right, so for this to work. So that's, that's the compactness theory for stable hypersurface. And, and this is all known for the area minimizing oriented hypersurfaces. So in technically um, rectifiable co-dimension one integral currents. Um, and these are of course sit stable. And, and, and this co-dimension seven conclusion actually was already known in, in this starting was, it took a decade to, to prove that. It, it, starting with DeGeorge's work in 1960, which implied that an area minimizer is almost everywhere regular. Step by step, people improve this result and to get to co-dimension seven for the singular set that during that decade, and people, um, so other, so DeGeorge and then also Armgren, Federer, Fleming, Simons eventually. And this is a sharp, I'll give you an example to show in a minute. This, this is a sharp, it's a sharp conclusion about the dimension, the singular set. No, I'm saying the, con uh, the conclusion is sharp. So, uh, what about that N minus two hypothesis? It's not. I'll come to that in a minute. That, that is the more recent work. But before I get to the more reform improved regularity theory, let, let me just go ahead with historical development a little bit further to show that how this implies existence, a better existence in co-dimension one. That's the work of Pitts in 1979. He improved Armgren's min-max construction. Remember, Armgren says that there is a stationary waterfall in every dimension, stationary integral waterfall. Pitts says that if you're in co-dimension one, you, this waterfall has special property called an almost minimizing property, which means that roughly speaking, this is an extremely technical construction, technical um, difficult work. Uh, but roughly speaking, what it means is that the, the thing you get in, in, in co-dimension one is can be locally approximated by uh, a sequence of stable hypersurfaces whose singular set is small, this small, n minus seven. Right? And, and the way he gets this is by, by the constructing these approximating guys to be area minimizes, but very locally in neighborhoods that depends on J. So that neighborhoods in which they're minimizing is degenerating. So you can't apply anything like compactness for area minimizers uniformly, but you know it's stable. They are stable, right? Stability is an infinitesimal condition. 
So then you, what you need is a compactness result for stable hypersurfaces with co-dimension seven singularities, which is precisely what Shane Simon and provided in general dimensions and Shane Simon Yao provided in low dimensions. So Pitts proved existence by appealing to this, um, this compactness results and, and ultimately get this beautiful result that, that every compact Riemannian manifold has a minimal hypersurface whose singular set is co-dimension seven. And, and recent work of Delalis and Tasnadi um, streamlined this uh, Pitts' construction. It's a nicer way of doing it, but still the same sort of philosophy. You do min-max, Armgren does min-max directly for the area functional on a space of hypersurfaces. Okay. They just, so far, this has been the philosophy, and this is the outcome of all of that work. Compactness theory for stable hypersurfaces and the min-max construction on the, well, the area function. So, so first of all, here's what I want to now is discuss how you can improve this regularity theory. So now we're getting into more recent work, current work. Um, on the one hand, and, and then on the other hand, once you have such an improved regularity theory, you expect some gain in the existence constructions. And that is also true. Okay, this is what I want to discuss for the rest of this lecture. So as I said, the conclusion of this theorem, co-dimension seven singularities is generally, is, is for stable ones, stable hypersurfaces, it's actually sharp because of this example here. It's a product of spheres, so this is, this is meant to be a, a three sphere with radius one over square root two. I'm, I want this product, I think of it as, as containing S7, unit, sub, unit sphere in R8. And the cone over that is, a, is, an, is an object in R8, and it is minimal. It is actually stable and has a singular point at the, at the tip. So you, get, you can't do any better than co-dimension seven in, in general. But the hypotheses are not sharp. You can do much better than that, just assuming singular set small. Now, of course, you, you can't drop completely. If you drop, if you just assume stable and nothing else, you know, something like a pair of cross planes is a counter example. You get a large singular set. You would like to get the same conclusion, n minus seven singular set. Or some, some, some smaller than n minus one. n minus one is a bad sort of, it's not good for a lot of things. So you need to make it lower than that. And, and to, to do that, you, you need some condition beyond stability. And, and, and to, do, to describe this condition, let me just make a definition. So we'll, we'll call a, a, a singular point, or for some, you know, a point P in, in, in a set Y in this manifold, a um, classical singularity if the set looks like this around that point, or that, or something like this. So hypersurfaces, C1 alpha hypersurfaces, up to coming along, meeting along a boundary um, in, a, in, a, in a C1 way or C1 alpha way. Okay. So it's a very regular structure, actually, right? It is, and there's nothing mysterious about it. It's a singular point because technically it's not embedded, but you know, it's the next best thing. So that's what a si classical singularity is. And then the, then, the, then the theorem is that once you have a stationary integral waterfall, we know by Allah's regularity theory there is a regular set somewhere, right? Which could be very small in measure, but we are going to assume stability only on that regular set. Okay? And then we throw in this condition that, that the waterfall has no classical singularity. So we're going to be excluding one very specific type of hypersurface singularities, or, or, or impose a structural condition. That's what we're doing, ruling out a certain structure of the waterfall. If you don't see that structure anywhere on the waterfall, then you get the sharp conclusion. Okay. So this theorem, this theorem generalizes both the area-minimizing hypersurfaces 
and Shane-Simon theory for stable hypersurfaces and, and gives you a single set of hypotheses which, which make both theory minimizing case and the Shane-Simon case uh, special cases. Because uh, if you had a classical singularity, you, it's not an area minimizing picture. You can just simply, so if you have this picture here, you can delete this and do that to save area. Right? Here's, this is the boundary, a fixing boundary here. That's a better competitor. It theorem does. It does rule out that example. Yeah. The the well, it's not obvious. I, I didn't state it that way. There is a theorem in here. There's a quantitative estimate in this theorem which says that as soon as the, the waterfall is close enough to a plane, it is regular in the interior. It, it breaks up into sheets. So it rules out. The theorem rules out. In fact, Shane Simon would rule this out, right? There's only one singular point. But this is not stable. That's the point. This next, this next make it highly unstable. Regular part is stable. No, no, because, because of this sort of neck. So this is like a catenoidal neck, right? It is regular, but it's unstable. So that's why. Right, so this is one special case. And, and I want to actually, I want you to sort of draw attention to another special case of the theorem, namely that it's enough to rule out classical cylindrical cones as tangent cones. Right? So if you want to check the no classical singularities assumption, obviously, if, if there is a classical singularity, then there's a, there's a tangent cone. You know, take a tangent cone of this. That, that consists of half planes meeting at a point. Right? Um, so if you can rule out such tangent cones, you would automatically will have ruled out classical singularities. That's easy. But, but the point is that, you see, it's enough to check that tangent cone condition away from a set of n minus 1 measure 0. This is very crucial. I want you to sort of kind of keep that in mind, because in, for the application I want to discuss in a minute, this is a, this is a crucial uh, feature. Because you see, once you know that away from a set of measure, n minus 1 measure 0, you have ruled out this side of tangent cones, you will have ruled out classical singularities, right? Because if there is a classical singularity, then somewhere, on a set of positive n minus 1 measure, you have this sort of type of tangent cones by definition of a classical singularity. So the distinction here is that the classical singularities condition is an actual structural condition, a lot weaker, uh, or no, oh, sorry, no classical singularities condition is a, is, a, is a weaker condition than an asymptotic condition about tangent cones. It's actually a condition ruling out a structure. Right? That's what allows you to ignore a set of n minus 1 measure 0 when you're checking the hypothesis. So, what I want to, uh, so let's just forget, let's just, go, uh, so this slide talks about maximum principles that you can prove for stationary waterfalls using this theorem, which was kind of my original sort of question I was thinking about how there were various maximum principles. You know, like I, I said that stationary waterfalls is a big mystery. We don't know the, any regularity uh, for this, except for Allard's theorem, which says the regular set is uh, dense. So, but you still like to prove some theorems, and, and in particular, maximum principles were proved under various assumptions for stationary waterfalls by Simon and Ilman. Um, and then th those can be improved into sharp sort of theorems by using the stability theory. But, so that's one application. But l l what I want to discuss um, here more is, is this existence construction again, how we can do it differently. So, so, the, so the idea is now to try to obtain a minimal hypersurface by, as a, as a weak limit of level sets of solutions to a, a family of PDEs. So here we're going to take the Alan Kahn equation again. So, but we're going to change this functional by a parameter, by modified by this parameter epsilon, a small parameter. Um, and W is fixed, it's a double well potential as before. Two minima, exactly two minima. 
Uh, and then, then there's a remarkable property of this functional, which was long known. This is a long history of, about the connection between this functional, its critical points, and the minimal surfaces, minimal hypersurfaces. Namely that if you have a sort of roughly, rough idea is that a sequence of critical points for these functionals for epsilon tending to zero, then if you look at these level sets for t less than one, um, of these these uh, solutions to the Allen Fanning equation, then they they concentrate on on a hypersurface, and that hypersurface actually it's a weakly minimal hypersurface. And 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 then this, sort of the reason is that this is this is approximating the area functional actually as epsilon tends to zero. See see what, what if you're willing to so if you're willing to assume okay maybe I'll state the theorem first and then I'll explain that in a bit. Um, so, so this connection historically was known, you know, by work of Modica and Sternberg in the minimizing case before. But, but what's relevant for us is that for existence theorems, the minimi working with minimizers is actually not not a good good thing, right? We can't always minimize things. The the the, the right thing to do is look at stable situations, stable critical points. That's the le that's the lesson we've learned, just from working with the area functional. And the same thing carries over to to this setting. We'll in a minute look at stable critical points of the Allen Kahn functional, but first, this theorem of Hutchinson and Tanagawa, which this tells you that just for stationary points, so just solutions to PDE, as soon as you have a uniform energy bound and a sup bound, you can make this idea precise that the, the level sets are converging to a minimal hypersurface in this way. This measure is concentrating on an n-dimensional measure. So some, some integer multiplicity theta, and this is exactly what, I, what we define to be as integral bar fold. And it is stationary for the area function. That's the conclusion of this. And the reason is that, that once you have a uniform energy bound, see this term here is trying to separate the domain into pieces where u is nearly 1 or minus 1, right? Because Remember, W has only two zeros at minus one and one. So once you have uniform bound on this, then the integral of W has to be become, becoming very small. So U prefers, you know, U, U is going to be close to minus one and one most of the time. So that creates an interface, typically. Okay. And then if you compute this, if you, so this interface would have thickness roughly epsilon, and therefore the gradient is like one over epsilon. If the gradient is 1 over epsilon, this is nothing but the area of the level sets, right, by the co-area formula. So that's why this is becoming close to the area functional. And indeed, all of this can be made precise, and this has been done by Hutchinson and Tanagawa, this work, which was building on Ilmanan's work of 1993, which uh, did the parabolic case, in fact. So the parabolic case analog of this came first. Um, who showed that the Allen Kahn, parabolic Allen Kahn equations converge to uh, weak, weak uh, mean curvature flow, Bracchi, uh, Bracchi flow. Right, so then, then you're going to throw in the stability assumption. That's what this next result says. Suppose, in addition to UJ being a, a critical point for the, PD, for the uh, Allen Kahn energy, it is, it is stable in the, in the usual sense, second variation, not negative in this way. So you get some kind of stability inequality here for the PDE now. And then, then, the, then the result is that the, 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 weak, the minimal surface you get from Hutchinson and Tanagawa is actually now a stable minimal hypersurface. You see, all of this is pointing in the direction of exist, proving existence by this method, right? You, you, now you're going to, constr if you can construct good critical points for the PDE, as opposed to doing anything like Armgren Pitts min max, you have a chance. You, you, this, is, this is the idea. Okay? And this can be done. That's going to be my next slide. Now, before I do that, let me just point out that for this theorem, to prove sharp regularity for this, for this interface, you need the full strength of the, the, the regularity theory for stable hypersurfaces. See, the reason is precisely, see, as David pointed out before, you see, you don't, so he, the theorem that I said about regular, you know, just stability on the regular part plus no classical singularities implies everything. 
the hidden there is, is a theorem that sort of a statement is that, that, that this kind of picture can't happen. You can't, if you, if you have a tangent cone, which is a plane of some multiplicity, it must be a regular point. It, it must be, the, the, the hypersurface has to be an embedded um, with, with fixed multiplicity every, um, constant uh, in, in that whole, whole uh, piece. So that, that's the, the no classical singularity assumption immediately rules out pictures like this. Um, so, so when we apply this theorem to get sharp regularity, you don't have to check anything about where points of tangent planes, uh, higher multiplicity tangent planes. Right. See, as I said, the, 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 the most difficult part in checking or uh, lowering the dimension of a singular set is handling singular points with potentially with higher multiplicity tangent planes. Because at the, tangents, at the tangent cone level, you lost information about the singularities at all. They are regular. But the point is, you know, it could be a singular. So, but, but the theorem says that you don't have to worry about that. Just you, what you have to do is check the no classical singularity assumption. That's a more checkable condition. Okay. So, um, and for the Alan Kahn problem, we don't really know enough about the convergence of these level sets. They're only converging as waterfalls to say anything about this set of points where, for the limit guy, you have a tangent plane, a uh, higher multiplicity tangent plane. And now the point is you don't need to know any of that. Okay, that's one point. That's why the full strength is needed. If you compare this to the Shane Simon version, for instance, you would have to check that such points are small in measure to apply. So it's hard to check anything about this set. And the second point is that the, set, the, the, the level sets can concentrate. The second fundamental form can concentrate on a set in the, in the support of the limit guy. And it's easy to check that the, the, the dimension, how sort of dimension of this set is at most n minus 2, but it's hard to get any more information. And the reason why this is easy is this is just a scaling argument, the way it scales. Right? Um, see, remember I, I said that back here, when you apply the theorem, so this point here, away from a set of n minus 1 measure 0, if you can rule out tangent cones of half planes meeting at at an axis, that's enough. You can, you're allowed to ignore a set of n minus one measures here, okay? And that is, that means that you can ignore this concentration set completely when you um, apply the theorem, okay? And so those are the reasons why the full strength is needed. And then, so the last step of the, of the construction is this elegant work of Garako um, just a couple of years ago, says that you can construct critical points with not stable ones, but most index bounded by one, and uniformly bounded, and, and energy bounded above and below. See, most index bound one is, is the next best thing. If you can't, if you, obviously, you can't con hope to get con a stable hypersurface in the, in, the, in the conclusion, right? No, see, those things don't exist. But, but you get the next best thing in index one, and therefore, as a, as a now you can, once you have index one, you can apply the, the theorem with Tanagawa, to get the sharp, um, sharp regularity. So you get as a corollary, you get, you get the same existence theorem in, by, by bypassing completely the Armgren Pitts min max procedure. I'll stop there. Oh, the other way. That's right, there's, there's work on that. Um, um, under some non-degeneracy assumptions, I think, there are, there are various theorems that you can go the other way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, so, yeah, well, one in 1D is somehow can be bad. So even for the, this direction, actually, 1D doesn't give you, it can create one singular point somewhere. Either Armgren Pitts or the Alan Kahn. Um.